it's good to be back here in Keystone. This is, this is kind of where it all started for me. Uh, this, is my, this is my home mountain. Um, I, grew up in, uh, I grew up in Loveland, Colorado. Any front range people here? Okay, that's a couple. Uh, went to school at the University of Colorado. That's Boulder. <laughs> this was back before they legalized marijuana and all the crazy stuff that happens now. Um, and, you know, my, uh, my dream started when I was 10 years old. I saw the Olympics for the first time. And I was really moved by this experience. And I saw freestyle skiing. And living in Loveland, we'd come up here every weekend as a family, um, really just because my, my parents loved to ski. And they loved to get outside of town. And they weren't trying to raise Olympians or, you know, anything like that. But I saw freestyle skiing at 10. And I was like, wow, I could, I could possibly go to the Olympics. And so at, at that moment, I knew that I wanted to ski in the Olympics and play in the NFL. John Elway was my biggest hero in, in, in football. Of course, he was in his, his prime when I was growing up. And so I told my parents that I wanted to dedicate my life to pursuing both of these dreams. And both my parents, um, I think, have a healthy disrespect for the impossible because they, they looked at me and they said, you know, you, you can do that if you put your mind to it and you attack your dreams. And that's really what, what stood out to me uh, when, I was, when I was at that age is, you know, I can't just dream about it. I really truly have to attack it with everything that I, I possibly have. Uh, and, th and that's what I, I focused on doing. And over the next 15 years, I was able to live out both of those dreams, um, skiing in two Olympics for the United States, uh, getting drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles, and then spending some time with the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And my, uh, my dad was my first kind of real ski coach. He was also my first uh, football coach. Uh, he coached the little league teams, and when he would come home from work, we'd throw the football in the backyard, probably not dissimilar to a lot of parents uh, here. He never said no. Anytime I wanted to catch passes in the backyard, he was, he was there to do it. And he also loved the Olympics. Like his passion for the Olympics just bled through to me. And so when the Olympics were on TV, you know, we'd be watching it together, and you know, an American athlete would win an Olympic gold medal, and I'd look over at my dad, and he's just a real emotional guy. And so he's like wiping the tears off his face. And you know, that's, that's powerful when, when you're young, and, and that affected me. And there's nothing that I wanted more in, in, in my life than to win an Olympic gold medal. Um, not only for myself, but for my dad uh, and for my mom, who took me to every single competition and traveled the globe supporting me in my efforts to, to, to live out uh, this dream. And my first Olympics, I was 19. It was in our home country, it was in Salt Lake. And uh, I remember walking in opening ceremonies, and it was just like this out-of-body experience. And the moment was really big for me. It was actually too big. Like, I was sick. I made myself sick. I was incredibly nervous. Um, I came into that Olympics as the number one ranked skier in the world and felt just a, really a ton of pressure. And it was hard for me to really kind of stay focused. Um, but then four years later, um, 2006 was Torino. And in 2005, I had won more World Cups, consecutive World Cups, than, than anybody in the history of the sport. Um, I had played major division one college football, and I, was, I really learned how to kind of deal with these types of, of, of big pressure events. And as the Torino Olympics kicked off, I was ready.
I had a great qualifying run, uh, and as I was pulling into that gate there in, in Torino, it was at night, um, not yet, we're getting there. I thought about a lot of things, you know, these things that go through your mind. I mean, I was 23, I'd worked my entire life for this one moment. Freestyle skiing, it's 20 some seconds. You've literally trained your entire life for 20 some seconds. A billion people watch the Olympics uh, around the world, but I wasn't nervous. It's kind of tunnel vision, and I just knew that that was, that was going to be my day. I thought about my mom, who was in the grandstands below. I thought about my dad, who was here in Colorado because he was too nervous to travel to Italy. And I just thought about all the time that I spent preparing for this one moment. And I had 20-some seconds to make a 23-year-old dream come true. One inch. One inch was the difference that day between sixth and first. A little break after the top jump. And uh, after I exited that gate, I did the, you know, the media thing, put on a smile as best you could. And my mom was waiting for me at the end. She, you know, you moms are great. Of course, she gives me the great big hug and says, I'm so proud of you, and I'm thinking, why? <laughs> but I love you anyway. Uh, but this was a heavy moment for me. 
And I went back to my, uh, my hotel room in Torino and kind of lost it. And, you know, I think that the common thread is for all of us, because we all go through moments like, these, like this in our lives. You know, maybe not in athletics, but in life. And I've always been fascinated because my athletic career in life has always been a series of wins and losses, ups and downs. You know, why, why do some people splat and other people bounce in these kind of experiences and moments? And uh, I set a rule for myself that night. Um, and I said, I'm going to give myself 48 hours to really feel bad for myself. Do whatever I need to do to whatever. I, I like to analyze things. So, you know, I was kind of in my own head dissecting everything that, that led up to that event, trying to figure out what I did wrong and how I could learn from it. And then I prescriptively, <laughs> with my own head, said, once that 48 hour window hits, I'm moving on. I'm not looking back and I'm gonna go a thousand miles ahead and you know, whatever was next. And what was next for me is um, that next day I boarded a, a flight to Indianapolis to participate in the NFL Combine, which is basically the event where the graduating class of football players around the country get to meet with the 32 NFL teams for the first time and they do all these series of events. So I went to the NFL Combine, um, met with a bunch of teams. Uh, I was kind of pinching myself because in a one week period I was competing in the Olympics and the NFL Combine. And about a month later, I was uh, sitting at my uh, dad's house in Fort Collins, and uh, it was the NFL draft. And if you ever have a friend that's possibly getting drafted in the NFL, don't call them on draft day. Literally, all my friends were messing with me the entire day, and I'm like, oh, oh. But uh, the phone uh, finally rang, and with a number I, I didn't recognize, and NFL Films was there to kind of capture my journey from uh, the Olympics to the NFL, and they captured this, uh, this moment, the NFL draft. I told you, he's always crying. <laughs> he's always crying. That's my dad. Uh, my dad grew up in Lower Marion, which is just outside of Philadelphia. All right, yeah. I hear Villanova won a pretty big basketball game. <laughs> I did okay, that was a heck of a game. Um, I had a, an unbelievable time playing in the, in the NFL, sharing the locker room with guys that were my heroes, like Donovan McNabb and Brian Dawkins and then going to the Pittsburgh Steelers and sharing a locker room with uh, Heinz Ward and, uh, and Ben Roethlisberger. Um, and getting coached by the best leader that I've ever been around in my entire life is Mike Tomlin, head coach for, for the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, he, he's this infectious personality type of guy that you just, just want to follow. You, want, you just would do anything for him. And it was interesting to, to see the differences between management styles 
of Andy Reid's regime at, in Philadelphia and, and Mike Tomlin's. Uh, and although on paper, I think we had a more talented team in Philadelphia, uh, we never got past the first round of the playoffs in, in Pittsburgh. I don't think we had quite the talent, but we had an amazing culture and an amazing management system that was bottom up and ended up winning the Super Bowl that year in 2008. But the NFL actually had a, a larger impact on my life off the football field. which is a great program if you're an NFL player where you can take MBA classes at Kellogg, Stanford, Harvard, or Wharton. And uh, Wharton was in my backyard, and I was kind of at this point in my um, career where I was, you know, I was looking at what I wanted to accomplish when I was 10, and I kind of was checking most of the boxes and, you know, started thinking I'm, you know, relatively young and the average lifespan of a, of a human. I'm, what am I, what's the next chapter of my life going to look like? And I was always worried and I was always fearful that um, my skills that I, I learned, in, you know, in, in football wouldn't translate to, to this world. And uh, that fear really drove me to plant a lot of seeds during my athletic career to, to see if maybe some of them would grow into areas of passion for me once, uh, once athletics was over. So... One of my professors, Peter Lenneman, um, who's a well-known economist and a very good friend and a good advisor to me, I wanted to start a, like a, a tech company while I was still playing, and he kind of laughed at me, and he said, you have no pattern recognition of what you're doing. <laughs> He's like, just keep playing football, and, and when you're done, you know, uh, lose somebody else's money first. Like, you know, <laughs> get, get some experience somewhere, and, and then if you find some, an area of opportunity, then, you know, maybe, maybe start something. And... My, uh, the first venture that, that I started um, outside of athletics was, was Wish of a Lifetime. And the idea I've had for a really long time, at least the idea of, of, of doing something for the oldest people in our country. My grandfather was a World War II hero. He flew 17 missions over Berlin. Um, he was a, a profound, had a profound impact on my life. Um, he was actually my very first ski instructor when I was three. Uh, my mom wouldn't let us eat candy inside the household, and he loved candy. And so at, at three on, the, on this mountain here, he would pack his pockets full of these little miniature-sized candy bars, and he'd throw them down the mountain. And, and if, if I was good enough to ski to get them, I could eat them. So just brilliant idea. <laughs> I, I absolutely loved skiing from a very young age, thanks to his creativity. And my, my grandmother actually grew up with us for the first 19 years of my life in, in, in my house in Loveland. And she actually lives up here full time at 90 years old and volunteers at the senior center. Uh, and just is just an incredible person. So I've always felt like we maybe don't do enough for the oldest generation. And maybe there is something that I, that I, could, I could do with the platform that I built with, uh, with athletics. And it happened in a conversation with my mom. Um, right around 2008 when I was with the Steelers, and we're thinking, well, what do you do? I mean, bingo night? Like, is that meaningful? Is that, no, no, it's not going to work. And she said, well, you know, you've been lucky to be born into a family that supported all your dreams. Not everybody has that opportunity. Why don't, why don't you grant their wishes? And it just was like, yes, that's, it just really connected, it's kind of similar to that moment I had when I was 10, when I saw the Olympics. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, the first wish that, that we granted was to Nancy Tarpon, and uh, I met Nancy at Volunteers of America before we had our 501c3 nonprofit status, before we were anything. I was just kind of doing some research around what do people wish for at that stage of their life. There's a lot of data, of course, with Make-A-Wish, you know, what kids wish for, but really I had no idea what people would, would want to, to do or experience um, into their 90s and, and even into their hundreds. And I met Nancy and I was talking to her and she didn't know who I was or why I wanted to talk to her, but she's just this really kind, soft-spoken person. And, uh, and I said, you know, if there's one thing in your life that you would want to do, what, what would that be? And she said, well, my, my daughter lives in Claypool, Arizona, which is really not too far from here. Um, she was diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer 10 years ago, and neither of us have the financial means to see each other. You know, pretty, pretty low-income family. Uh, fixed income, those types of things. And she said, I'd speak to her um, every day on the phone and her condition's getting bad and it just tears my heart out to know that uh, I'm going to have to say goodbye to her without seeing her. And I was just floored. Like, here I was skiing, you know, all these places and, you know, throwing a football around and doing all these weird things. And, you know, she couldn't even get to Claypool, Arizona to see her daughter who, who was dying. 
And so I said, all right, well, we're going to Claypool, Arizona. <laughs> and this is a picture uh, of us in the Phoenix Terminal. Um, and this, this moment had a really big impact on my life. I was considering going back and, and trying for my third Olympics. But um, I, I, took, uh, I took Nancy to, to Claypool. I dropped her off. I met Lucille. I picked her up three days later, and she was a completely different person. I mean, she, she just had this glow to her that was more powerful than you know, any gold medal or anything that I had experienced for myself. And it was bigger than myself, much bigger than, than myself. And I actually, this day, I called my mom and said, I'm retiring from skiing, and, and I'm going to really focus on, on Wish of a Lifetime. Tom had a, a very unique wish. Um, he had end-of-life emphysema, so he couldn't travel anymore. But he always, I mean, you guys help. What, what I think is so cool about all of you is, is you guys help people experience adventure and travel, which in my life, those have been the best moments of my, of my life. And it's so fun that you guys get to do that as a career. Um, you're not building marketing software. <laughs> I'll get to that later. But uh, um, Tom, uh, he, he just really wanted to travel, and he wanted to experience other places. And so he, his wish, to wish of a lifetime, was like, literally said, hey, do you think somebody could send me a postcard of another state? And, you know, because I haven't been outside of Alabama a lot, and maybe they could write on the, uh, on the back of that postcard what, it was, what, it, what it's like. And I could live through kind of their experiences. So we said, oh, that's pretty unique. Let's, let's see what happens. So we put it on our Facebook page um, and, our, and our, our Twitter. And before we know, we you know, got some retweets and some things like this. But we never thought that this would happen. When, when we met Tom, he, he was in hospice. This was a year and a half ago. He was given uh, just a few months to live. Uh, a year and a half later, he's out of hospice, and he's doing fantastically well. Uh, for, yeah. We, uh, this was, all, all, you know, we get a lot of reconnections, um, you know, meaningful connections in people's lives that they want to reconnect with different people along the path of our journeys, right? This was, this was a, a unique one because it was three sisters who were all living in three separate states who all grew up on a farm together and hadn't seen each other in over 10 years. What was unique about this wish is that the youngest who rode into Wish of a Lifetime to, to see Ruth and Rose uh, was 104. 
And <laughs> the oldest was 112, and this was a photo of them growing up in the farm, I believe in Kansas. And so we were like, whoa, like, first of all, we need to meet these people, and like, what's the secret to longevity, right? Like, what's your secret? <laughs> Self-serving. But uh, <laughs> it's just remarkable. And so we flew them all to, to Connecticut, and this is them. We, we pulled up two, two couches. They're, they're all, you know, all three of them are still really with it and talked about all kinds of crazy things growing up, and, and it was fun and interesting to be part of that conversation. And I certainly asked them, I said, you know, what is, what is your secret? To, to longevity with, with your family. And this was a quote that, that, that uh, I think Ruth told me. She said, oh, honey, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you smoke or which, <laughs> something or other, but just never stop moving. You know, uh, life gets hard and your joints get sore and, you know, you, you want to just stop living but all three of us, we just never stop moving. We're always walking, we're always reading, we're always engaged in life, and we've never shut down. And, uh, you know, we've granted thousands of wishes, of, wishes now, and uh, I typically ask that question to a lot of our centarians or, you know, healthy people into their 90s, and that is the common thread. The common thread is never stop moving, and uh, I, I try to think about that a lot. Marion's wish I, I, I love because he's a Tuskegee warman. Tuskegee Airman in World War II. And I'm sure some of you may not be familiar with the Tuskegee Airman. I wasn't when he first, his, his wish was, was submitted. But what's, what's so interesting about the Tuskegee Airmen is that they fought for our country at a time that African Americans were thought of as second class citizens. So it was the first African American uh, militia uh, pilots um, who ever were allowed to fly uh, for the US um, uh, military. And they did so for a country who didn't even really recognize them as citizens. And I think that's a, that's a remarkable um, sacrifice for, uh, for, for somebody. And his, his wish was to get back into the, the plane, the, the, the P-150 or 50 or something like that. Um, and he hadn't been in it since, uh, since World War II. And this is a picture um, of, of him outside, uh, I believe this was the coast of of California giving a little salute in the back of, of the plane. And it was a really cool, special moment for him. And um, Olive is 96. Now, her wish was cool because she, she wished to see the future. And what she meant by that is she wanted to go take a site visit to Google and see all the innovation that's happening inside of one of the most innovative companies. It's so innovative, they shut down all. <laughs> Google doesn't want you to see what's going on inside of Google. If you could push, there we go. Robin That's my hero. That's who, that's who I aspire to be at 90, 90 97. Uh, so two years into running uh, Wish of a Lifetime, I, I learned pretty quickly that 
having a nonprofit's not a great way to make a living. <laughs> you don't, yeah, you're kind of funding the whole thing. And uh, so I, I thought about, um, you know, what Peter had told me. And I joined a really small startup. I was running customer acquisition. I had no idea what I was doing. I don't even know why I was hired. But I was just eager to learn and excited to, to do something other than, than football and skiing. And about um, eight months into that, that startup, my biggest pain point, there, there wasn't software to solve. Um, and you know, we, were rel you know, we were B2B marketers, not B2C, um, which uh, there's a lot of purchase decision behaviors that go into that. So anyway, I left and, and I started uh, my first startup um, called Integrate. We just turned six years old, actually. And it's, it's just been a, uh, you know, just like athletics, the uh, highest of some highs and the lowest of some lows. And, you know, we've, we've now raised three rounds of, of venture capital from um, Founder Group, who's based in Boulder, Liberty Global, is based in Denver, and uh, Comcast, who you probably all hate. <laughs> we like them. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've almost failed twice. Um, two years ago, actually, I thought we were definitely done. We broke a loan covenant, and, but, but we persevere, just, just like, you know, uh, I've just approached it just like athletics. As you, yeah, you come up to these obstacles and barriers, and it doesn't look good, and, you know, you have to wake up the next morning from Torino and figure out, you know, where you're going next. And, you know, so there's so much, there's all these common areas between my journey and, in athletics, and now my journey in for-profit and, uh, and non-profit, and building a company in a non-profit. And so what I thought in the, um, to, to close out you know, the um, this story would be to just kind of you know, boil down what, what are the things that if I had to take a look at the body of work in sports and you know, six years in, into building a company, you know, what's been most impactful or most important or top of mind for me um, that might you know, help you uh, in, in building your, your companies. Um, this is by far the number one thing I've learned is, you know, especially in the hiring process, it's easy to, to, to get uh, hypnotized by a resume or, you know, find a really, you know, a lot of, a lot of competency, but those cultural question marks, um, you know, we, we had cultural question marks in, in, in the, for the Eagles. We had a management team that uh, led by fear, and so very commonly you would come into a meeting room uh, and you'd hear, well, you know, if, if you don't do this, you're out of here. You know, we'll find there's a lot of other people who want to replace you, which, which led to a culture of a bunch of individuals in a locker room kind of looking around like, oh gosh, I wonder who's the next person to get cut, and it created a lot of victim-based thinking, like, oh, it wasn't me, it was you, you know, if you're pointing the fingers. Um, and I don't think that that creates a connective lock arms type of culture that helps you fight above your weight. So, I, I, you know, we've been uh, very um, prescriptive in defining culture because it's kind of this big fuzzy word, like what does it mean? Okay, yeah, everybody wants to have a good culture, but how do you define that? How do you keep yourself um, responsible for, for building that? And so we define it in five ways. Uh, the first cultural pillar is performance. And, you know, I, I got this a little bit from Reed Hastings at Netflix. I think Netflix has an incredible culture. And I think Reed does a great job of it. But it's this common belief that nothing's more important than building value to whatever the team is, whatever the company is, whatever it is. And granted, you know, we all want to rise the ranks and get promoted, and there's a lot of things, and they're not mutually exclusive, but it's my belief that if you can have a team that really puts all their hands in and says, our number one job, and our number one focus is to add value to the business, and everything comes secondary, um, I think it's easy to lock arms with people like that. The second one is entrepreneurial. It's super easy to be, think entrepreneurial in your first couple years, because you don't know what you're becoming. You know, you start a company, you think you're going to be this, but that you end up being that, and you're throwing everything against the table, and, and it's really easy to be entrepreneurial. But as you grow and you mature and you, and you develop structure in order to scale, um, I think it's important to remind uh, people, at least, you know, certainly at Integrate, that, hey, let's never lose our comfort of jumping out of the airplane and assembling the parachute on the way down. And that's kind of the type of thinking that you need to, to be able to be, to take those big risks, to not be too conservative. This is a really big one for me. I love it when people make mistakes. I think it's cool. And I think it's even cooler when they say, that one's on me. I, I just, I celebrate it. Um, and as long as, you know, we're not making the same mistakes twice, you know, we got to learn from it. But 
But I, I love a culture. I've always loved coaches. I've always loved leaders that, that can come in and say, you know what? I thought it was going to work this way. It didn't. It worked that way. It's on me. Let's get better from it. Let's move on. It's, I think it, I find it really hard uh, to, to, to work with people that can never take that personal responsibility and kind of are always you know, pointing the fingers. And we've all done it. I've certainly done it. But I, you know, reminding myself, hey, you don't do that, you know, is, is, uh, is certainly helpful. It's really easy to be a factory worker. You know, you come in, here's your assembly line, you know, just like, kind of like go through the motions. And uh, so I really try to encourage a, a, a culture where think creatively. Some of the best ideas that helped advance, integrate, um, and wish of a lifetime came from people in different functional areas of the business where accounting will be like, well, why does sales do it this way? And like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Why do we do it that way? And let's think about it and let's kind of retool it. So encouraging people to think creatively, take 5% of their time, 10% of their time to think across the organization and bring um, different ideas has been really helpful. And this is the biggest one. You know, we, we have what's called a no, uh, no asshole rule um, <laughs> and, uh, and a no rock star rule. And, and um, two of them are both really, really important. And the humility side is, uh, look, you know, the company's bigger than all of us. Uh, the company would be fine without me. I accept that, but um, I'm here to try to do my best. Um, and this, this no rock star rule, because we have a lot of really creative rock star type people who have built billion dollar companies leading different functional areas of Integrate. And, and uh, you know, as soon as, as we become... Well, as soon as we think of ourselves as a rock star, it's a path to entitlement. And entitlement typically turns into a cultural virus that can bring down, you know, the morale of the team. So, you know, I, I want to win. I want to win really badly. I'm very competitive, but I don't want to win at all costs. I don't want to win uh, with a culture that is toxic, that people hate going to work, that, that, that it, it is not conducive to creativity and, and respect. This was a, um, a concept that I learned. I read a book in 2005 called uh, The Power of Intention. And um, I, I got to this chapter, and it said, you know, give up your need to win, which was a completely foreign concept to me, because my whole life at that point has been built on, you know, gold medals and, and, uh, and winning. And, but I felt myself just continue to come back to this idea of what would, you know, what would, what would it feel like to, to give up that, that need, and you know, maybe I could find a more holistic source of, of motivation. And so what I did is I started helping my, uh, my competitors um, you know, giving them course, tips on the course or, or whatever, like, hey, watch out for that. And it, it really liberated, I think, my, um, the ego from, um, you know, me needing to beat this person to just looking inside and saying, how do I become the best possible skier in the world? And that, that's that, the next year where I won more consecutive World Cups uh, than anyone. It's, it, I, I really attribute it to this quality. And um, th this idea ha has given me the ability to, when we make big mistakes that could be catastrophic, to be able to step away from those, not overly personalize them so I can think with a clear mind about you know, how we get through them instead of really personalizing them and allowing them to, to kind of create this, this heavy feeling. Um, you know, uh, I've always, as I mentioned, I've always been really interested in this concept of you know, bouncers and splatters. And I think about guys like Steve Jobs that was fired from Apple. You know, he, he had every reason to just retire and go to a beach. He had all the money that he needed to. And he didn't need to go start Pixar. He didn't need to start a company called Next, which was eventually bought by Apple. Um, he didn't need to do all those types of things. Michael Jordan didn't get cut from his high school basketball team once. He got cut three times. How many people would keep going back to basketball after being cut three times in high school? So like, what, what, what is it um, you know, about, about these people? And I've been so lucky to be surrounded in my life with a lot of them. And, and so this past fall, um, with uh, Entrepreneur Magazine, or their, their, their press side, um, I dove deep into this topic and spent a bunch of time with people that I respected and learned a lot through this process. I really wrote this book for my own therapy, not to, to, you know, as a commercial venture. But it's really interesting the things that, that I was able to learn through this from other people. Um, and if you're also interested in this topic, there's, there's parts of this book that you know, people that you probably have a lot of respect for that share some of the wisdom of how they've been able to, um, to, to catapult from that. And in closing, I want to leave you with uh, a slide, that, a, a picture that lives on my desk and on my phone and, and something I, I think is just so true for, for all of us. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just... 
investors, we all want that up and to the right, but that's never reality. And you know, we live in this kind of social world where people are only sh sharing kind of that, the, the moments of like their life is good, but everybody, I don't care who you are, I don't care how successful you are, I don't care how much money you are, I don't care how many gold medals you are, it doesn't matter, everybody goes through those, those periods of downtime. And you know, if, if we can all think about ways to like step back from that and realize that the ups are near, it, it, it makes us enjoy our lives more and what's more important than enjoying our lives because you know, this journey goes really fast. So we should enjoy it. We should enjoy the ups. We should enjoy the downs. We should learn from the downs and we should celebrate it. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share my journey with, with all of you today. It's a truly an honor and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you.